There we go. Okay, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, so let's start out with the attendance question for the day. Hopefully you'll see the relevance to the reading from today, but if not, it'll all be clear. But um, this is a perpetually interesting topic for me in philosophy of science. Do theoretical entities in science, the kinds of things that are not directly observable, things like black holes in cosmology, super strings in particle physics, quarks, gravity waves, these highly theoretical entities, do they really exist? Or are they merely useful fictions postulated basically to make the math come out right? Especially in physics, but in other areas as well. So think about that and uh, post your response in the, the course discussion board by the uh, end of the day, please. Um, sooner the better, but by, at least by the end of the day. <clears throat> so the, the topic for today is basically the nature of truth. And, and this is such, this sounds like one of these really silly philosophical topics, like what possible philosophical issue could there be with the nature of truth? Either something is true or it's not true. So on the one hand, it's actually, I think, a little hard to appreciate the significance of this, of this topic. Um, we've covered a little bit of this already uh, when we were talking about philosophy of language with, with Wittgenstein. But there are different theories of truth, and the most intuitive theory of truth, the one that people point to as like, oh, well, this is the day-to-day, the -day, man on the street kind of definition of truth, is what's known as the correspondence theory of truth. Basically, it means truth as reference, that something is true if it refers to the thing that it's supposed to correctly refer to. Um, you know, the example I always, I would use in class, you guys know me by now, is like I'd use my coffee cup. Like, okay, if my coffee cup is on the desk, if I have a sentence, my cup is on the desk, that's true if and only if the cup is on the desk, right? If, the, if that sentence refers to a true state of the world, then that sentence is, is true. Um, actually, could I ask you guys to, to mute? Um, I'm getting some feedback. I'm not sure whose microphone is, is giving feedback, but if you guys could just go ahead and mute, and then if you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute. That way I don't get my own voice back in my, in my earphones here. Thank you. Um, so that's the, the basic idea of truth, you know, the, the intuitive from the hip notion of truth, truth as reference. True sentences refer to things that are true in the world, and if they match, if they correspond to each other, then you end up with true, true statements. Um, right off the bat, I think you can see the heart of the question I, I asked in the, in the attendance question. Do these highly theoretical entities, black holes, strings in string theory, gravity waves, do they actually refer to actual entities in, in the universe or are they merely theoretical constructs? So right off the bat, once you get into theoretical areas, it's not obvious that, that the terms refer to anything in, in the actual world. That takes some justification, some proof, scientific or philosophical or otherwise. It's also a challenge in metaphysics. How do you show that metaphysical concepts, abstract numbers, abstract entities, um, abstract properties, general properties, Plato's forms, for example, that all of those things refer to something real and are not merely linguistic or theoretical constructs. So even though that is the most intuitive notion of truth, um, you know, very quickly you get into some philosophical and scientific and theoretical issues with, with terms that don't obviously refer to anything that we can, we can verify with our, with our senses. But nonetheless, I think it's a pretty easy to understand notion of truth. You've got a bit of language. That bit of language is true if it corresponds to reality in some way, physical or metaphysical. Um, there's another theory of truth that you should have read from your reading known as the, the, the coherence theory of truth. Um, this is a little hard to visualize. I'm going to take my, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute so you can see me gesturing mainly. Um, the basic idea behind the coherence theory of truth is that we don't have the ability to verify all of the things we believe. A great many of our beliefs, moral, ethical, political, uh, sociological, uh, religious beliefs, they don't obviously refer to anything we can verify. But we do have a very complex web of belief, things we believe um, about each other, about ourselves, about the world around us, uh, and it's massively complicated. So you can think of your entire belief system, your entire worldview as a web of individual beliefs. I think the key to understanding this view is that some of those beliefs are very central to your worldview. 
there are things that you're less likely to give up because they're so fundamental to either who you are or your belief system. You know, uh, religious beliefs can have this quality. Beliefs about your own authenticity can have this quality. And those things are really central and really tightly woven into your web of beliefs. You know, if I were going to draw this, which is a little hard to do right now because I don't have a chalkboard behind me, but if I was going to draw a web of beliefs, I would draw a bunch of like points, a lot of dots on the wall, some of which are going to be really compact and tightly woven together, and some of which are going to be more periphery. Um, the ones that are more tightly woven are the things that are crucial to your belief system, the things you're less likely to give up and more important to you, more essential to who you are. They're stronger beliefs. The things that are on the periphery might be things you believe, but things you're willing to modify as you encounter new evidence, as you change, as, you, as people present you with other ways of looking at things. You might change some of those beliefs. And um, I would bet that for most of you, myself included, that over time, your overall worldview has changed, that certain um, items on that web of belief, things you might have held at one point, Modif got changed, got modified at some point based on new evidence or based on looking at something in a new way, thinking about things in a way you haven't thought of before, encountering different, uh, different worldviews besides your own. And you've got this really interesting challenge. You know, if you have a, a, a web of belief, you know, your entire belief system, your entire worldview, some things are really tightly held, some beliefs are more periphery and you're willing to change. And you encounter some new piece of evidence, a new way of looking at something. It could be scientific evidence, it could be a different worldview, it could be uh, you know, some revelation about yourself, whatever it is. You encounter something that doesn't fit with your web of beliefs. You have a really interesting challenge now to decide what to do. You can either reject it because it doesn't fit in with what you already believe. Um, uh, people who have a religious worldview do this all the time. You know, they encounter some piece of um, uh, some piece of counter evidence that doesn't match up with their religious belief and they just reject it. They just say that doesn't match up with what I believe. So that can't be true. It doesn't fit with my web of beliefs. Um, you can also try to incorporate it. You can try to modify your beliefs slightly and try to incorporate that new piece of evidence. And then it's not clear at all about, you know, which, how it affects which type of beliefs. You know, if it if it's contradicts something uh, on the periphery of your web of beliefs, something you're more willing to change, no problem. Maybe you can incorporate that pretty easily. But if it's something that conflicts with your core beliefs, the things that are tightly woven in your web of beliefs, you're probably more likely to reject it as counter evidence, not, not recognize it even as true because it conflicts with something you know, so core to you. And sometimes that inner core of your web of beliefs does change. You get so much counter evidence or encounter the world and, or yourself in a new way and you end up radically modifying your web of, web of beliefs. But I think the, the crucial thing here is that about this view, this coherence theory of truth, is that any one of those moves is a rational move. None of those things is irrational. If you encounter something that doesn't fit with, with your web, web of beliefs, it is rational to reject it because it doesn't fit with your web of beliefs. It's also rational to try to incorporate it into your web of beliefs. And at a certain point, it can also be rational to modify your core beliefs if the amount of counter, counter evidence you're encountering gives you strong reason to do so. I guess my, my point is that rationality doesn't settle the issue one way or the other. Each one of those moves is a potentially rational belief. Uh, let, let me share my screen again. There we go. So the key to this view of truth, the coherence theory of truth, is that what makes any one of those individual beliefs true or false on this view is not that it stands on its own. It's how well it fits, how well it coheres with your entire web of beliefs. So on the correspondence theory of truth, you can really look at each belief on its own. You can say, okay, here's one particular belief or one particular sentence or a particular proposition. And you can say, well, that's either true or false if it corresponds to reality. On the coherence theory, you can see it's not that simple. You look at any one of those web of uh, any one of those items in your web of belief, and you have to ask how well does it fit in with all of these other beliefs? How well does it cohere with your moral beliefs or your religious beliefs or your beliefs about the natural world or your beliefs about yourself or your beliefs about other people? And so it's a massively complex network of things you believe. And then what makes something true is how well it fits with the rest of your beliefs. Each one of those beliefs doesn't stand on its own. But again, there's no 
objective viewpoint to um, adjudicate, to decide whether any one of those beliefs is true or false. If you encounter a new piece of evidence, you can reject it, you can try to incorporate it, you can keep your fundamental beliefs, but change your periphery beliefs. You can try to eventually maybe modify your, your core beliefs, all of which are, are rational, not settled by, by rationality. So those, I think of those as like the two, the two main theories of truth. Um, truth as reference versus truth as, as coherence. Um, are there any questions before I, before I move on to talk about other theories of truth? There's something a little dissatisfying about the coherence theory of truth because you, anytime you sort of step away from objectivity, you sort of go, wait a minute, how do, how then do we collectively decide what's true and what's false? You know, I've got my individual web of beliefs, you have your individual web of beliefs. As a culture and as a society, I think we generally have our sort of communal shared web of beliefs, things we share as Americans or share as part of a tradition or share geographically or share as part of a religious tradition. Um, but you lose that objective standpoint to say, oh, no, no, this is objectively true and this is objectively false. All you can do is say, how well does this fit in with my entire belief system? Any questions? Okay, so the next theory that I want to talk about is the pragmatic theory of truth. And I've always had a hard time with this, with this theory of truth, honestly. The basic idea is that something is true if it's useful. Um, I think the heart behind, the, the, the core message behind this theory is that it tries to sort of adjudicate or, or delineate between those pieces of knowledge that are useful and have practical impact, practical import, and those pieces of supposed knowledge that are really fundamentally useless, useless that don't have any pragmatic uh, import. You could see that from a philosophical standpoint, a lot of the sort of abstract metaphysics, things that Plato was talking about, things that Descartes was talking about, um, especially philosophers like, um, here's a philosopher we didn't really talk about in class, but Leibniz, who had this really sort of beautiful theory of monads. He thought that each, uh, each instance of something in reality was a, basically a, a duplicate of a monad. It was like just really metaphysically heavy stuff. You know, from a pragmatic standpoint, you can look at a philosophy like that and say, that's a beautiful theory, but it's not very useful to me in living my life and getting things done and accomplishing things and building things. So it's a lot of philosophical mumbo jumbo. So the pragmatic theory tries to say what makes something true is, is its practical application. Uh, um, I think you can see this like uh, say in moral philosophy, if you have moral beliefs, what's right or wrong, moral, morally correct, morally incorrect. Um, what makes those moral statements true on the pragmatic theory is their practical import. They guide your, your life in some way. They have practical implica implication in the decisions that you make from day to day to day. So those statements are true, not because they refer to some metaphysical platonic heaven like Plato thought, um, but they have practical application in, in our day to day lives. And that would, that's what makes them true. Uh, you can see how this might come up in, in theoretical science as well. Like if you've got a, a very um, abstract scientific theory, like if you're a, a, a theoretical physicist and you're talking about super string theory, um, you know, what, what matter is made of, you can say, well, all of matter is made of atoms, which are made of quarks, which are made of whatever, leptons, which are made of um, eventually these things called super strings. Okay, and that's what matter is made of, that's your, if that's your theory. Um, I haven't really kept up on this in the last few years. I don't know where the state of theoretical physics is, is at as much as I used to. But if that's the theory you're running with, an important question would be, well, what's its practical application? How do you test that theory? How can we put that theory into practice? What can we build with it? What can we accomplish with it? How could we falsify it and check to see whether that theory is correct? What empirical observations can we predict from that theory? And if the answer is nothing, then the theory is kind of like metaphysical mumbo jumbo. It sounds like a theory, but really it's not a very useful theory. And this is one of the critiques of, of highly abstract theoretical sciences, because immediately you want to ask, well, what testable hypotheses can the, do these theories give you? How can you test them? And if the answer is, well, there is no way to test them because they're, the objects are too big or too small, 
you know, on the cosmic scale or on the, uh, you know, the level of fundamental physics, particle physics, and there's no testable predictions, then you can say it's not a very pragmatic theory. So what reason should we have to accept it as a, as a true theory? Um, so I think that this is an interesting theory because it comes up in a lot of, a lot of areas. Every time you kind of catch yourself going, you know, being really abstract or non-empirical, you can ask, well, what's the practical implication of this theory or this supposedly true statement? And if the answer is, well, nothing, <laughs> then you don't have a very useful theory and there's no reason to take those, uh, those uh, claims as, as true. So that's called the pragmatic theory. Uh, you know, things are, are true. Bits of language or sentences, propositions, concepts, whatever, are true because of their usefulness in their practical application. Um, in the next bullet, I've got postmodern theory. And I would even hesitate to call it postmodern theory because there's so many different varieties of this, like we've looked at at the last couple of class sessions. But I think you can lump a lot of these together. All of these other three theories, correspondence theory, even coherence theory, there's a level of objectivity to the way in which beliefs cohere rationally together. You know, if, if you're a coherence theorist and you're worried about how well your uh, individual beliefs fit with each other, you're still basically relying on rationality. Either they cohere and they don't contradict each other, or there's some internal tension, logical contradictions in the things you believe. Um, there's still something objective about that. Maybe not objective about the truth of your beliefs, but at least objective about the rationality and how well your beliefs cohere together. And on the pragmatic theory, I think there's something obviously objective about whether, whether something is pragmatic or not, whether something is empirically testable or not. On postmodern theory, though, any one of these, it could be truth as subjective truth, truth as cultural truth, truth as, in historical context, um, I would call this local or regional truth. You know, I think the, the kinds of cultural assumptions you have, I would say maybe here in Idaho are different than the cultural assumptions I had in California, which are different than the cultural assumptions they have in Japan, right? That kind of local or regional truth. Um, truth as narrative that we looked at uh, a couple class sessions ago with Leotard. Hyper reality, you know, it being uh, impossible to distinguish between reality and the simulation of reality or the, or the artificial constructs in reality. Truth as metaphor that we looked at a few weeks ago with Nietzsche and truth as uh, power knowledge, for example, that we looked at with Foucault. All of these undercut the notion that truth is something objective in the first place. You know, they take it different directions, of course, but they all basically undercut the objectivity of truth. Whereas these first three theories, correspondence theory, coherence theory, and pragmatic theory, all basically have objectivity at their core. Even though with coherence theory, it's hard to prove uh, absolutely the truth of any particular belief system because all you can rely on is the web of your beliefs and how well your beliefs cohere together. So that's a, a quick overview of different theories of truth. Um, I feel some obligation to talk about different nuances of truth. I mean, those are the main theories of truth. I don't think they're particularly hard to, hard to grasp. I think it's, it's fun to look at your own beliefs in this light. What are the things you believe that are provable because of correspondence? Things you can directly say, oh, I can prove that because it corresponds to reality in some way. Um, these worries about hyper-reality aside. Um, what are the, the ways in which your own beliefs cohere together? And I think most importantly for, for all of you guys, and th I think this is a lifelong process. This is true for me. It's especially true when you're younger. It's especially true if you were raised within a particular tradition, a particular culture, a particular religious belief, particular worldview. At a certain point, I think you start to realize, all of us do in some way, if you're even remotely self-aware and, and, and conscious of, of your own worldview, that there are certain things that you believe that fit really well together and make sense. And there are certain things that don't cohere, beliefs that seem to contradict each other. Um, it could be as flagrant and simplistic as science versus religion, evolution versus creation. It could be moral beliefs that you have. It could be belief, political beliefs that don't seem to cohere with other things you believe. And as you start to encounter these anomalies in your, in your, your, your own belief system, in your own worldview, these um, sort of what I would describe as a node in your web of belief where that node does not cohere with other things you believe. 
I think there's a there's an intellectual burden to try to reconcile those things. Some people don't. Some people never do. I think some people just say, yeah, it's complicated or, you know, I'm not God, so I don't understand <laughs> as, as much as God does. And it all fits together somehow, but I'm not going to worry about it very much. I think that's a really intellectually lazy way out. I think the, the more intellectually honest thing to do is to recognize those tensions as tensions, that there is a logical contradiction between some of those beliefs. And then you've got to decide what to do about it. You can either reject some of your beliefs as false because they don't cohere with other things you believe. You can try to modify them in some way, you know, so they do try to cohere in some way that makes logical sense to you. Um, and ultimately, you could change your core beliefs, you know, change your religion, change your culture, change your whatever, you know, become a, become a Zen Buddhist for all I care, right? You know, you can, you can change your, your overall belief system in, 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 a, in a radical way, or you can say, no, 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 I really am going to try to make sense of this, this, uh, these tensions between these things we believe. And I think, personally, some of the most interesting theoretical work that's being done out there is to try to not just draw attention to the to the the contradictions between things we believe and if you're religious and you also have some faith in evolutionary science they they contradict each other on the surface but the interesting thing to do is to try to reconcile the two is there some way where we can recharacterize religious belief or recharacterize scientific belief so the overall you know resulting worldview incorporating both of those things coheres better than it seems to on the surface. And there's a lot of really interesting theoretical work being done to reconcile morality with science, with evolution, with religious belief, and people who are interested in those things, you know, scientists who happen to be religious or religious people who happen to be interested in science, those people are doing really interesting theoretical work on these lines. And if you want, if you want references, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I can point you to, a, to you know, 50 different sources that would be a, an interesting place to go to. But what, what happens, unfortunately, I think culturally, is that we like, we like dichotomies. We like to say, oh, it's science or it's religion. We like morality or we like science. We like this or we like that. We like these strong dividing lines between these disciplines and between these areas of human experience. But really, there are people on the front lines of these discussions who fall into these different categories, and they themselves recognize that it's not as as easy as it might seem to make them cohere, but it's also overly simplistic to draw dividing lines and separate these domains of human experience into different categories. And the people that live on that in that middle ground, who, uh, you know, in the in the Venn overlapping Venn diagram region between these different disciplines or different areas of human experience. The people who are intellectually honest are really trying to reconcile those seemingly different belief systems into some coherent whole. And there's a lot of really interesting theoretical work that's been done in, in those areas in the last 20 or 30 years. If you're interested in that kind of thing, let me know and I can point you the right direction, things you might want to read or, or uh, uh, even even video, videos you could watch about it by, by some of the key players. Um, so that's my take on the coherence theory. Um, broadly, I think correspondence theory is really useful for sort of day-to-day -day empirical things, you know, like, oh, is the coffee cup on the table or coffee cup not on the table? You can point to things and go, yes, that's true or that's false. But a lot of our beliefs don't have that quality. Our moral beliefs, our religious beliefs, our beliefs about ourselves, our beliefs about other people. Um, religious beliefs, moral beliefs, all those, those types of beliefs don't have a strong, uh, a strong reference, something you can point to as true or false. And yet they're supposed to, right? If you, if you are religious and you believe in God as a divine being, in theory, that does refer to a God that really exists, that should be able to, there should be some correspondence between reality and, 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 your, and your beliefs. The problem is you can't point to it. You can't say, oh, there it is to actually verify that something is true. So in that situation where you don't have a referent that's obviously visible or empirical, I think you almost invariably have to fall back to the coherence theory of truth, where all you can do is say, well, I've got some evidence for believing this. What is that evidence? Well, it relies on all these other things I believe. It, you know, it, it relies on testimony from other people, or it relies on scientific evidence, relies on some moral beliefs that I have over here, and all of that coheres together, and that gives me my reason for believing something or not believing in something. 
And I think practically when you do encounter something that doesn't match your belief system, you know, and for you guys, I think this probably happens, you know, this is part of growing up. I think you grow up in a particular tradition with a particular cultural view or religious view. And then as you get older, you start to encounter people from a different worldview, different mindset. You learn about a bunch of things that you didn't learn about when you were growing up. And now you've got this problem. You ha you're learning about all these things, these either, either beliefs or scientific practices or ways of living, you know, different modes of human life that you know, different cultures have. And now you have to go, okay, what do I do? Do I reject all of that because it doesn't fit with the things I already believe? Or do you try to incorporate it in some way and build a coherent worldview for yourself by incorporating new features into it and by modifying some of the things you already believe? Hopefully with coherence as the goal. And I think the coherence theory does a better job of capturing how we actually reason day to day to day when we encounter something that doesn't match up with our worldview. You know, I catch myself doing this all the time. I sort of go, that doesn't match up with how I am or how my, what my worldview is. So I'm just going to reject it. That's the, I think that's the easy move, the low hanging fruit. The harder move is to say, okay, let me try to look at that new piece of evidence for what it is on its own terms, put myself in that mindset, and then try to incorporate that into my worldview. And I think that's really hard because it forces you to modify some of the things you believe, either as your own worldview or about yourself or about other people or whatever. And that's really hard to reach a coherent worldview by modifying your own beliefs. But I think that's how we actually do reason day in and day out when we, when we encounter something that doesn't fit. And in this global um, cosmopolitan world we live in, no matter how culturally isolated you are, you're going to encounter things that don't fit with your worldview. And at every turn, I think you're faced with a choice. Do I reject that or do I see it for what it is and try to incorporate it in some way? And either one of those two moves is a rational move because there's nothing about any one of those beliefs that settles the issue once and for all. Because you don't have for most of these beliefs, the important ones, the political beliefs, the moral beliefs, the spiritual beliefs, the religious beliefs, the emotional beliefs, whatever they are, there's nothing you can point to empirically to say, ah, that settles it. This is obviously true, like the coffee cup being on the table is true because you just can't point to those things. You have to fall back on how well they cohere with each other. So I think that of that as a really important theory of truth because it actually mirrors how we decide what to believe, what we incorporate into our worldview and how we change our worldview or how we resist changing our worldview when we encounter things that we don't believe. Uh, I think you can see this in politics. I think, you know, I don't need to dwell on this, but I think you can see it in the politics of the day very easily. People sticking to their core political philosophy, no matter what counter evidence you throw at them, versus people who are willing to change their views on any particular position to incorporate new evidence. Those are just two different modes of being. But I think it's it's also overly overly quick to reject the first move as irrational. You could, you know, if someone who has a, is dedicated to their core religious beliefs and they encounter some beliefs that don't fit, it's not irrational to say, no, 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 I'm going to reject that because it is rational to say that doesn't fit with everything else I believe. That's a rational move too. Um, so uh, in my mind, this boils down to the fact that each one of us has to make a choice. You know, do I try to incorporate this anomaly into my, into my worldview or do I stick to my core beliefs and just reject anything that doesn't, doesn't match, you know, do you swat it away with a fly swatter? Um, but I think the, the, the interesting thing and the slightly dissatisfying thing about coherence theory is that either one of those approach, approaches is fully rational. The people who choose to reject counter evidence because it, it uh, doesn't match up with their core beliefs are not being irrational on that view. But it's just as rational to say, okay, that doesn't fit. Let me try to incorporate that. And each one of us does that in our own different, different ways based on our worldview and how we were, uh, you know, the experiences we had formatively and the things we've been exposed to and, and whatnot. Um, that's going to look some, like very different for all of us. And I guess my point is just that it's a lifelong process. You know, you guys who are in your 20s are at a different stage in this process than I am being, you know, being 41. And people who are 70 have gone through a lot more of this. They've maybe encountered a lot more and they've had to go through a worldview process, worldview modification process. I really think this is a, a good feature of human nature to constantly be looking at your worldview and asking yourself, is this coherent or are there things in my life or things I believe or things culturally or things scientifically that don't match, that don't, 
cohere together and being willing to modify your worldview along your life's journey to, to try to take into account the different experiences and different things you're exposed to in the course of your life. I think that's part of the, uh, the frustrating thing about doing philosophy in a human lifetime, but also the rewarding things to see how your worldview progresses and changes over time as you encounter new ways of being. I think there's something ex exciting and inspiring about that, but it's also deeply frustrating. If you're hell bent on, on holding on to your uh, core worldview, no matter what, then everything the world throws at you, every belief that doesn't match up with these core beliefs is going to be like an attack to you, something you have to reject. <laughs> and I think that's a really frustrating way to be. I think it's more exciting and for me, more satisfying eventually to go to recognize the frustration, like, yeah, things don't match up here, but I really do want to build a coherent, coherent worldview and being willing to go where the evidence and the counter evidence and the new ways of being new, new uh, features of experience that you're exposed to in the course of your life to try to incorporate those in some way. I think that is part of the um, sort of beauty and inspiring quality of a human life. So you guys can do with it as you like, but I think it's something to pay attention to is you probably have been doing this all along in the course of your upbringing, in the course of the things you're being exposed to in college, in the course of the different um, cultures and worldviews that you're exposed to in this global world. You're already doing this process of modifying your worldview. You probably just haven't been paying attention to it. Try to pay some explicit attention to it and see what, which parts of your worldview really do match and which parts of your worldview don't match. And when you encounter something that doesn't match, that's when you go, okay, aha, I'm in one of these moments right now. I'm encountering something that doesn't match with all these other things I believe. What do I do? Do I just reject it or do I try to incorporate it in some way? If you make that a conscious process, I think you'll be more in control of your worldview and you won't be, you know, won't be uh, dragged along by the winds of culture and the winds of politics and the winds of religion and, you know, being dragged along like a, like a, a sled by a, by a bunch of sled dogs. Uh, the, I don't know why I'm using that metaphor, but I guess I'm speaking in metaphors today. Um, so I think the coherence theory is really, is really useful for um, describing how we actually do form our, our worldviews as, as humans. But I, I do want to spend some time talking about other features of truth. Some of these things we've alluded to already in the course of the class. One key distinction when you're talking about truth is the distinction between contingent truth and necessary truth, or what you could call empirical truth or logical truth. The basic distinction is this. Something is contingent or empirical if it's something that happens to be true but doesn't have to be true. So for example, I'm just going to use the silly coffee cup example. The coffee cup is on the table. That is true, it's right now, you guys can't see it here, but maybe you can see it, no, I guess not. I was gonna try to, the, the Zoom background doesn't, doesn't like it, but there's a coffee cup right here on my table. Um, that doesn't have to be true, right? I can change it, I can pick up the coffee cup, try to get it on camera, there you go. Um, and now that statement's not true anymore, right? It's false that the coffee cup is on the table if I pick up the coffee cup. That is a contingent truth. Could be true, but doesn't have to be true. But there are necessary or logical truths, things that are true by definition, things that cannot be false. Largely, these are mathematical and logical statements. Things like A equals A, you know, one of these uh, axioms or postulates that you'd have in geometry or algebra. Um, you know, A equals A, I, I guess I could write it here so you guys can see it. There you go, A equals A. No matter what A is, no matter what it stands for, a number, an object, whatever, it's something is always going to be self-identical, identical to itself, right? That can't be false, no matter what you plug in for A. So that would be an example of a necessary truth or what's known as a logical truth. Um, in math, it might be something like 2 plus 2 equals 4 can't help but be true. It's a necessarily true statement. Um, and there are a bunch of these. And if you, if you take a logic class, you'll learn some of these basic logical axioms, logical rules that you use to deduce further things that are true. But the idea is that they're intrinsically true. They can't be false. There's no possible way for them to be false. And you can see why, if, if you recognize that this is a, a valid form of truth, you can see why certain people gravitate towards mathematics or gravitate towards the abstract, towards logical reasoning, because that's where you get some certainty. All the things that are frustrating about forming your own worldview with ethics and morality and beliefs and authenticity and politics, and you know, that's really messy territory. But A equals A, 
two plus two equals four, even something as complex as calculus, there's a certainty and a precision to those things. The, the, the necessity of the, of the things you learn in those disciplines are somewhat safe and comfortable. And you can see why a certain group of people gravitate towards that, that, um, those, those disciplines because that's where you get actual certainty. And I think some comfort that goes along with that. You can evade a lot of the messiness of, of dealing with worldviews and religion and politics and all the uncertainty of human life by focusing on math and logic in your entire life. Um, but it sidesteps a lot of the, the important human issues. So that's a key distinction. Um, you know, even um, you can see when we were talking about medieval philosophy a few weeks ago, the medieval philosophers really relied on this distinction. They said that most of the things in the, in the natural world, human life, natural objects, man-made objects, none of those have to be. They're all created. They're all contingent, in other words. They're true. They exist, but they don't have to exist because in that mindset, God didn't have to create them. But they looked at God as a unique kind of being, a necessarily existing being, a being that can't be otherwise in order to account for the existence of all the contingent things in the first place. So um, this is this distinction has a rich tradition, but I think it comes to its, its um, it reaches its zenith in, uh, in medieval philosophy because, because medieval philosophers really relied on this distinction between the contingent created world and the necessarily existing divine being in the form of the Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian God in the medieval time period. Um, so that's an important distinction to keep in mind. Um, what's interesting to me, though, is a lot of the um, a lot of the interesting features of human life. A lot of the things we talked about, religion and politics and morality and whatnot. Those they're not empirical. You can't point to, you know, to to the to the principles in question. And say, oh, this is obviously true because I can point to the truth of it here in the empirical world. They don't seem to be logically true. If you say have a belief like murder is wrong that doesn't have the kind of necessity to it that A equals A has or two plus two equals four has. It seems to fall into a different kind of category. So these are interesting, useful distinctions in certain areas of thought, but they don't obviously apply to, you know, the, the important features of human life. So I kind of question how useful the distinction is uh, when, when the rubber meets the road when we talk about the important human concepts. I want to spend some time talking about scientific truth. Um, I think you can see why, you know, looking at Leotard in the uh, postmodern condition, he basically has this view that we're living in a largely scientific age. You know, if something doesn't fit within the scientific worldview, it's generally rejected as not true. Mere belief, mere religion, mere subjectivity, mere culture. So scientific truth is for us in, this, in these postmodern 21st century times, largely the hallmark of truth. If something doesn't fit the scientific rubric, then it's, you know, it's something lesser than, 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 than knowledge, lesser than true. But I want to talk about some of the issues of truth in science. Um, really, we could have a whole class just about this. Uh, you know, it's hard to make this kind of thing happen in a community college, but I've taught a class on philosophy of science, and it's fascinating because each one of these things that sounds so uh, obvious from a, from a popular culture standpoint about what science is and how science functions is actually quite a bit more complicated and more nuanced and less, less simple than, than you might think at first glance. So one of the core issues in philosophy of science is the distinction between verification and falsification. In other words, what should science be doing when you set up an experiment to, to, to uh, prove something in science, quote unquote, prove something in science? What do you actually do? And there's two things you can basically try to do. You can try to verify something or you can try to falsify something by showing that the, the principle in question or the theory in question doesn't doesn't actually work out and doesn't have the testable consequences that you think it does. So if a theory predicts something and you come up with a counterexample, you do the experiment, you get a different result, you have arguably falsified the theory. You've shown that the predictions of the theory are false. And in the early 20th century, this was a discussion in philosophy of science. How should science function? Should science try to verify for certain statements, scientific theories and whatnot, or should science try to falsify theories? Uh, and what happened is that uh, his, in the history of, of philosophy of science, the scientists and philosophers gravitated towards falsification. And I think you can see why. Like I, I put an example here. Here's a statement. 
you could you could plug in a, any scientific theory you want here and you'll get the same result. All swans are white. If that's your theory, if that's your, your statement in question, you can either try to verify that or you can try to falsify that. What would it mean to verify all swans are white? How would you go about verifying that? You can turn on your microphones and, and respond. How would you verify all swans are white? What would you have to do in order to verify that? Find every swan. Yeah, you'd have to go out and find, what, what would you be looking for though? <laughs> Uh, one that's not white well no that would be falsification you'd be right? if you're verifying for, you're looking for white swans you're trying to find every yeah. white swan there is to show that all swans are white right yeah every swan you can find so you're looking for confirming instances but i a oh, well there probably are there is a finite number of swans so this is theoretically possible it's not very practically possible perhaps uh and especially difficult when you get into other areas of science if you say things like all stars are made of hydrogen like well how do you verify that you have to go verify every star in the universe you know it's possible but it, practically impossible right you can't do that in practice um how would you go about falsifying this? You answered it already. What would you be looking for? If you're not trying to find confirming instances, you're looking for disconfirming instances. So what would it take to show this theory is false? You only have to find one thing. What is it? A swan that's not white. A swan that's not white. If you can find one swan that's not white, you have disproved the theory that all swans are white. So looking at the difference between those two examples trying to find as many confirming instances as you can find to verify the theory versus trying to disprove the theory by finding a single disconfirming instance you can see which one is going to be more fruitful right one you'll never you'll never finish you'll never find enough confirming evidence to prove that all swans are white until you've verified every single swan in existence but again that's harder when you're talking about things like stars in the stars in the universe um, or electrons. If you say something like all electrons have a negative charge, how would you confirm that? You have to verify every single electron in the universe. You can't do that, right? Maybe in principle, but not, not in practice. Um, but if your theory is, well, all electrons are negative, if you can find a single electron with a positive charge, you've disproved the theory. In other words, that's gonna be a more fruitful way to move science forward, to come up with a hypothesis, and then what is the goal? It's not to verify the hypothesis by confirming that it's true. The goal is to set up an experiment that tries to disprove the theory. And if you can do it, you've moved science forward because you've, you've shown that theory to be false and you know you have to come up with a better theory. And if you look at the history of science, the history of science moves forward not by verifying but by disproving theories. And this, what's interesting to me is we still don't tell this story very well to elementary school children or high school, high school students. We still sort of naively say, well, you set up an experiment and you prove your conclusion. That's not actually how science functions. Science functions by coming up with a hypothesis and then going in search of a disproof of that hypothesis. And if you look at the different theories and hypotheses that have existed in the history of science, there have been a lot of bad ones. <laughs> you know, whether it's um, Aristotelian science or Newtonian science, even uh, Einstein's relativistic physics has some problems, much less all of the, um, the concepts in biology. Like an, an example that comes to mind, because um, I'm interested in it, I'm a, I'm a ham radio operator and I know a bit about radio waves and whatnot. They used to believe that if there were waves, radio waves, electromagnetic radiation, light waves even, that there had to be a medium within which the wave moves because other waves like water waves and sound waves have to move through a medium. Water waves move through water, sound waves move through air or other media. Um, what about electromagnetic radiation? If they're waves, then they have to be waving something. They have to be moving through something. So there was this concept called the luminiferous ether, the ether that filled up all of space within which electromagnetic radiation moved because electromag electromagnetic radiation can be seen as a wave. Turns out that that's just false. <laughs> and there were some exper key experiments that proved that it had to be, had to be false. But the key was that it wasn't, it didn't verify a correct hypothesis. What it did was disprove an earlier wrong hypothesis. So all of science seems to move forward by falsification, not by verification. 
And that's how you end up with statements that are taken as true in science when they survive this attempt at falsification, not because they're verified in the sense of showing that all swans are white or showing that all stars are made of hydrogen or showing that all electrons are made of, uh, or have a negative charge. Um, it's not a very hard point to grasp, I think, but it's, it's interesting to me that we still don't te really teach this adequately to anyone in, early, in their early education who's interested in science. We kind of hold on to this naive notion that we prove a hypothesis, where actually, if you look at the history of science, most of it happens by disproof rather than by, rather than by proof. <clears throat> in the early 20th century, there was a movement called logical positivism, and this is again one of these philosophical terms that I that causes more problems in understanding what it means than than uh, than it's helpful. But the idea is this: um, with the with the rise of contemporary science, you know, from Galileo and Copernicus onwards, all of the scientific uh, progress that was happening in the late nineteenth century and the early twentieth century, it became really important to separate and distinguish what's genuine science versus what's pseudoscience, or what's real science versus what's philosophical metaphysics. Trying to delineate or demarcate what's genuine science and what's not genuine science. And this still comes up to this day. You know, people go, oh, astrology is science, or, or uh, telepathy is science, or uh, you know, pick your favorite pseudoscience as a science. It still is important to distinguish real science from pseudoscience. But they came up with what, what is called the verifiability criterion. And the idea was this. They basically said the only things that are meaningful, and this is a pretty broad claim. This is why it doesn't really hold up and it, it was a fad and it kind of faded away. They basically said the only things that are meaningful are the things that you can empirically verify. So my coffee cup on the table, no problem. That's a meaningful statement. It's a testable statement. I can empirically verify whether my coffee cup is on the table. What about something like God exists? You can't empirically verify that. So they would say, they just reject it. They rejected all the, 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 they rejected it not even as meaningful. They would just say, that's a meaningless bit of language. It's like, like we use the example of Alice in Wonderland or uh, not Alice in Wonderland, uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky poem. You know, um, Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toes did gyre and gimbal in the wave. And it sounds like language, but it really is just mumbo jumbo. They basically said that about all of religion, all of metaphysics, all of morality, all of these supposedly meaningful statements, God exists, murder is wrong, pick your favorite metaphysical or religious or, or moral statement. And they re rejected all of it as meaningless mumbo jumbo because it was not empirically verifiable. And the only things that are, are meaningful are things that are empirically verifiable. The coffee cup on the table, even things like e electrons having a negative charge. Well, you can do a theory, you can do an experiment and you can test that. Maybe you can't prove all of them have a negative charge, but at least you can say, you know, these electrons I'm working with here have a negative charge. So that's meaningful. Um, something scientific uh, falls into the category of things that are, that are verifiable or at least falsifiable. Um, so they just drew a really strong dividing line between scientific language that's meaningful and every other use of language that is basically mumbo jumbo, philosophically or religiously or morally or, or otherwise. That view is called logical positivism. And I, I hate the term because it doesn't really capture the, the essence of that view, which is just that the only things that are meaningful are the things that, are, that you can empirically verify with, with your senses in principle. Like in principle, we could show that all electrons are negative. We can't do that in practice because we can't see enough of them, you know, in the, in probably ever in the course of human existence. But we can, um, in principle, we could do that if we had enough time, if we had enough resources, if, you know, if we were, if a human life, lifespan was uh, the length of the cosmos, for example, maybe we could in, in principle verify that. Um, so that's logical positivism. It basically said scientific statements that are empirically verifiable are meaningful, and those are the things that can be true. Everything else is just meaningless mumbo jumbo. It doesn't even make sense to talk about truth or falsity of those things. It's just meaningless. Uh, so they reject all of metaphysics, all of religion, all of morality, anything abstract that's not empirically verifiable, they just write it off in one fell swoop. It was an incredibly popular view for a hot minute in the first part of the 20th century. <laughs> Um, I mentioned the demarcation problem, trying to decide what's scientific and what's not scientific. And that's not as easy as, it's, as it sounds. You can see already that it's not easy to 
delineate um, genuine science from these other areas of human thought and human inquiry, especially as science gets more and more theoretical. You know, in theoretical physics, uh, science is constantly talking about uh, entities, postulating entities that you can't see, you can't observe directly, you can only observe them indirectly, if at all. I mean, even the obvious ones, atoms, molecules, um, subatomic particles, quarks and leptons, and, and uh, as you get further down, superstrings, if you're a, a string theorist. But even on the cosmic scale, things like the structure of the cosmos as, the whole, as a whole, things like whether black holes exist, um, pick your favorite, um, you know, concept from cosmology on the, on the, on the cosmic scale, things that are not directly empirically verifiable as science gets more and more theoretical. Um, there's a real question like, uh, do, do those things, are those views even scientific views? If, if they don't have testable empirical consequences, if you can't do an experiment to verify or falsify those theories, are they even scientific in the first place? Or are they more like philosophy doing abstract metaphysics uh, in the realm of things that are not empirically testable? So on the one hand, it sounds kind of easy. Like, oh, obviously certain things are testable and certain things are not testable. But the problem with that nice easy dividing line between what's scientific and what's not scientific is that as science gets more theoretical, you lose some of the empirical testability that defines science as we ordinarily think of it. Most, science, most sciences have something that's not directly empirically testable as part of their theories. Psychologists have, have uh, terms and concepts and structures that are not directly empirically testifiable. Sociologically, that's true. Uh, in chemistry and biology, there are, th there are concepts that are not directly empirically testable. And yet they're supposed to refer to things in the real world, but they're not directly empirical or, or testable. Not directly, maybe indirectly, maybe indirectly, but a lot of them are not even testable in principle. Things like, uh, in physics, might be things like the Planck length, the, the smallest fundamental length that there is. Is that testable? Not really. Um, so the question is, do those, do those things refer? Do they not refer? Um, and then, of course, do they count as science or do they not count as science? Are those statements meaningful or are they not meaningful? Can they even be true or are they meaningless like the logic, logical positive, positivists thought they were? Um, all of that is a more nuanced understanding of the nature of science as it relates to philosophy or as it relates to the concept of truth than the ordinary run-of-the-mill man-on-the-street notion of science that most students are taught about when they're learning about science. Probably all through your K-12 education, you had a fairly naive notion of science, not really realizing that science has been a progressive discipline that only moves forward by falsification and relying at every turn on concepts that are not directly empirically verifiable. And of course, Leotard jumps all over this, saying that science relies on things that aren't scientific in ways that science itself is unwilling to recognize. We talked about that a lot two class sessions ago when we were talking about Leotard. So hence the, the attendance question. Do theoretical scientific terms, electrons, quarks, strings, dimensions, black holes, do they really exist or are they merely useful constructs? That is a huge open question in any area of theoretical science. Um, I, but what's interesting is that most scientists don't realize this issue. You know, they almost um, naively take for granted that the terms that they are relying on to do their science actually refer to something real. It's very hard to get a scientist to entertain the possibility that those concepts and those terms are theoretical constructs that may not directly refer to the entities that they think they refer to, um, where it's not obvious at all because you can't empirically verify some of these things, at least not, at least not directly. Um, some of them we can, electrons and whatnot, good evidence for those. Quarks, some good evidence for those. Strings, not so much. You're in, you're in uh, untestable theory. Higher dimensions, beyond three dimensions of, you know, three, four of space and time. You know, if your theory postulates, like superstring theory postulates, I forget the number, like you say 21 dimensions. If your theory postulates 21 spatial dimensions to make the math come out right, I think your immediate self-critical question should be, yeah, but how do you prove that? How could you possibly verify a statement like that other than the fact that that's how you make the numbers come out right? To postulate that. 
Uh, is that scientific or is that more metaphysical in nature beyond the domain of, uh, of science? Have science stepped beyond the bounds of the, th of the type of evidence that they, they accept as scientific? That's not obvious at all and a very interesting question in the theoretical sciences. And again, this is the kind of thing that doesn't get much attention in the sort of K-12 you know, let me tell you how science is and why science is better than all these other disciplines kind of story that we're told about the nature of science growing up in our, in our early education. Real science has these theoretical issues and it's not obvious at all that, um, that science has made as much progress in any one of these areas as scientists like to think. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is this philosopher Thomas Kuhn, who I've alluded to a few times now, because I, I can't help it because he, he's directly related to some of the things we have been talking about. We ordinarily think of science as progressive. You know, we know more than Aristotle did, and we know more than Newton did, and we know more than Einstein did, and Einstein knew more than Newton did, and Newton knew more than Aristotle did. It's kind of linear progressive model of science. Thomas Kuhn is a philosopher that, looking at the history of science, you said, no, that's not actually how it worked. What's happened at each one of these key moves in the history of science, the shift from Aristotelian science to um, the, the Copernican revolution with Copernicus and Galileo, to Newtonian science with Newton, to relativistic physics with Einstein, to quantum mechanics in, in the early and mid 20th century. At each one of those important stages, it's not been progressive. What's happened is the entire uh, underlying assumptions of the natural world get rewritten and reconceived. So it's not linear and progressive in that way. It's that there's a type, what he calls a paradigm shift. What you have in the history of science is a shift from one paradigm, one worldview way of conceiving, conceiving the natural world, a shift to a completely different worldview where all of the underlying assumptions get reconceived and, and rewritten. It's actually really similar to this coherence theory of truth. If you think of a scientific worldview as a web of beliefs with the underlying principles of the natural world as the core beliefs, what happens is that you get anomalies. Like in, um, for example, in Newtonian physics, one of the anomalies, one of the things that didn't match up was the orbit of Mercury. So Newton's, Newton, you know, everyone knows Newton's laws, right? They had some predictable consequences about the motion of natural bodies through space, right? Including the planets around the sun. Turns out that the orbit of Mercury, the planet closest to the sun, was an anomaly. It wasn't predicting the orbit of Mercury correctly. Um, that's an anomaly. Why doesn't, why aren't the, the equations coming out right? Why aren't they making the correct predictions? So what are the ways you could approach that? One way is to try, to try to modify that belief and kind of save the theory in some way. Um, maybe, maybe Newton got it mostly right, but there are these edge cases where you kind of you know, ad hoc make some modifications to the theory to take that into account. But what actually needed to happen was a complete reconception of those underlying assumptions. And so along comes Einstein with a theory of relativity. And it turns out that the general theory of relativity and that theory of gravity made better predictions than Newton did. It was more accurate. So it wasn't just a matter of sort of modifying Newton's theory. It was a matter of completely reconceiving the natural world. Rather than talking about gravity as action at a distance like Newton did, Einstein now talked about gravity as a warping of space-time. And that worked a lot better, <laughs> it turns out. And all of a sudden, we could predict accurately the, the, the motion of Mercury around the sun. And that was fascinating, but that's a great example of, it's not just a modification of Newton's theory, it's a complete reconception of the natural world and all of the underlying assumptions. That's a paradigm shift. Um, it's analogous to someone with a religious view encountering something that doesn't fit, trying to decide, what do I do? Do I try to kind of slightly modify my religious view to take this into account? Or do I completely reconceive my worldview to take the new evidence into account? That's the difference that, that Kuhn was talking about as it relates to the history of science. Um, does anyone know about um, the philosopher or a scientist, ancient scientist and philosopher Ptolemy and his epicycles? Anyone know about this? Oh, okay, no one. So there was this ancient astronomer, Ptolemy. Um, 
trying to give an explanation of why the planets seem to move through the sky as they do. And if you know anything about the planets, the whole reason they're called planets in the first place is that they, they don't follow the path of the stars that move across the sky. They, move, they seem to move backwards sometimes and they have their own patterns. They wander and that's why they're called planets because they wander. That's what the word planet means, wanderer essentially. Um, what Ptolemy tried to do, he tried to give an account of the motions of the heavens across the sky and the motions of the planets that kind of move backwards sometimes in terms of epicycles. So if planets orbit the, basically, you know, kind of with the earth is at the center, if the cosmos is orbiting earth, of course we know it doesn't work this way now, but this is what they were conceiving. If the cosmos orbits the earth, kind of spins around, what would account for planets sometimes seeming to move backwards? So if the planets are moving across the sky like this, what he said is that, well, what's happening is that as the, the planets are moving through the arc of the sky, they're actually moving in little circles, what he called epicycles. So as they're moving like this, moving little, little circular orbits along the sky, they would sometimes appear to be moving backwards and then they would move forward again. And then as they, as they continue through the arc of the sky, they would move backwards and then move forward again as they do these little epicycles. Same thing with the moons orbiting those planets, little epicycles of epicycles. Um, and this was his way of explaining the motion of the planets. It was beautiful. Um, actually, it did a fairly decent job of predicting where the planet should be. You can explain the motion of the planets in that way. Um, Turns out it's wrong, of course, we know that now, but it had very sort of accurate, predictable consequences. And this is one of the, one of the dangers of relying on, on predictable, testable consequences, of relying on verification as opposed to relying on falsification. If you, insofar as epicycles did actually predict the, the motion of the planets very well, it was very easy to verify them. Oh yeah, look, the planet's doing what Ptolemy says it did. Epicycles must be how the cosmos works. And it turns out it was fundamentally wrong because at a certain point, it had some consequences that were wrong that made the wrong predictions. And Newton did it better. And eventually Einstein did it better than Newton. But the danger is that, you know, if you hold on to this view that, that, that the planets move in terms of epicycles along the sky, you can say, well, okay, it's not, it's not predicting, predicting the motion of the planets perfectly, there are still some anomalies. And what Ptolemy tried to do is say, well, where, the, where there's an anomaly, where the, a circular epicycle doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, explain the motion of the planets, he'd postulate epicycles within epicycles. He'd say, well, there's these, it does these tiny little epicycles of an epicycle until he, until he kind of massaged it just right to get the predictions coming out correctly. That kind of modification of a theory is called an ad hoc modification to the theory, slightly modifying the theory to basically save the theory from being disproven by modifying it to take into account these anomalous pieces, pieces of evidence. That's generally considered a bad thing because it shows there's something fundamentally wrong with a the theory if you're constantly modifying it, modifying it, modifying it to try to save the theory. You know what this reminds me of? It actually reminds me of conspiracy theorists. Like if you are a person who believes that we never did the moon landing, that that was fake, that was you know, produced on a soundstage somewhere and it was never a real event. This is a, you know, a fairly popular conspiracy theory. Any piece of evidence you, you point to, well, what about the fact that we can bounce a laser beam off the moon because they put a mirror on the moon and the, which reflects a laser beam back to Earth and we can measure that. They just will give an alternative explanation of that. Um, same thing with uh, like the flat earth theory would be a, a very contemporary example. No matter what piece of evidence you point to, the way the stars seem to move across the heaven, the way the earth looks from satellites, the way we seem to be able to go around the earth on an airplane, whatever it is, they will say, no, 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 no. It actually only works that way because of blah, 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 blah. And they'll tell some story trying desperately to save their, their flat earth theory, no matter what counter evidence you throw at them. Um, that is generally considered to be a bad form of reasoning because you're, you're just kind of ad hoc changing your theory you know, in very subtle ways, holding on to the core of the theory to save that core, no matter how much counter evidence is being thrown at it. And from a scientific standpoint, probably from a logical standpoint, that's generally taken to be a bad thing. Not completely irrational though, given the nature of coherence theory in general. You know, if, if flat earth is your core theory and that's your web of beliefs, it is somewhat rational to say, no, 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 this counter evidence just doesn't fit 
So I'm just not even going to accept it as counter evidence, not even, uh, not even take it seriously because it doesn't match, match with the core of what you believe. So again, I think coherence theory really is fruitful in explaining why certain people reason the way they do from a cons conspiracy theory standpoint, from the history of science standpoint, um, why certain scientific theories get held on to versus get rejected and replaced in, in a later paradigm shift. Coherence theory is really fruitful for explaining all of that in ways that the, correspond the naive simplistic correspondence theory doesn't seem to be able to. Um, are there any questions so far? I know we've talked about a lot, but especially if anyone's interested in the sciences, if you're in the medical field or if you're planning on going into one of the sciences, I hope this was an interesting foray into the history and philosophy of science. But are there any questions about any of these concepts before we move on to talk about the last few things I wanted to talk about in, in 10 minutes? Speak now or we'll move on. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, um, and I almost didn't include this, but I, I, I still think it's interesting, um, are different types of definitions. You could naively say, well, if you want to know what something means, go look it up in the dictionary. If you want to understand the sci uh, you know, a scientific term or a term you don't understand or whether a statement is true or false, obviously you have to know the definitions of the terms and questions. And that, in some sense, that will tell you whether the statement is true or false based on the definitions of the words. But even definitions are not as simple as, as you might think because there are different types of definitions for different purposes. So for example, um, I'm just going to give you a few of these and give a really quick explanation of these. And you can see how even, even the mere concept of defining a word is, is complicated. A stipulative definition is a, is a definition that's postulated for a certain purpose. You can say, for the purpose of this, and I, I've done this in class, for the purpose of this discussion, let's let the term rationalist mean blah, 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 blah where you just arbitrarily postulate a definition for the purpose of a particular discussion or a certain context. Um, science does this to some extent, right? You know, for the purpose of, of this discussion, negative means electrical charge, blah, 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 right? So it's just postulating a definition, stipulating it. That's one kind of definition. Um, lexical definition is actually on here. This is kind of like what you think is your standard dictionary definition. What does a word mean in that language in the dictionary? Lexical definition. A uh, precising definition, a definition that's used to make the term more, make a, a concept more precise. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. Um, <clears throat> boy, I wish I had one off the top of my head, and now I can't think of one, obviously. Let me, let me think here. You know, if you have an, an overly general, overly broad term, like... Um, uh, even in philosophy, I could say philosopher. What is a philosopher? Blah, 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 blah. I can give you a very general definition of a philosopher. And you could say, well, actually, there's this kind of philosopher and that kind of philosopher. There's empiricist, there's rationalist, there's existentialist. All of those are precising definitions. They make the terms and the concepts more precise, more, more narrow, more, less broadly defined. And a lot of definitions serve that purpose. They try to say, you know, here's a kind of definition, um, you know, maybe, a, a, or actually, we can look at this from the, from the perspective of the natural world. You can say, let's take the ter a term like mammal. A whale is a mammal. Well, yeah, okay, well, what's a mammal? Well, there's different kinds of mammals. There's aquatic mammals, there's land mammals, there's big, big mammals, small mammals. The, the whole notion of a genus and a species is basically a precising definition. You can say, well, yes, you have this large genus, but within that genus, you've got different species. And within that, you've got different, even narrower classifications. All the definitions of those species, as you get further and further, more and more specific in the, in the natural kingdom, all of those basically take this broad term, this broad genus, and make the, make the definition more precise. Theoretical definitions, things like what is, a, what is a, a, a black hole, for example? Well, a black hole for the purpose of science would be you know, a, a, a singularity where the, where the mass is so great that gravity causes space to bend so much that nothing can escape the gravity well that it creates. Okay, that's a theoretical definition of a black hole. What is a black hole? The warping of space-time, according to Einstein. That's a theoretical definition of a term, black hole. 
and a lot of scientific terms rely on theoretical definitions, which are different than stipulative definitions, which are different than precising definitions. Persuasive definitions. Sometimes you can use definitions to persuade people. You can define your terms and you know where the goal is to try to persuade people. This happens in politics all the time. Defining terms and relying on definitions that have this persuasive quality. You know, if you could say, well, what's a what's a what's a democrat well oh a democrat is a you know blah 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 if you're a republican the goal is to try to persuade people not to be a democrat or vice versa right the that kind of um biased definition is it it's it is a type of definition but it's not not a very uh you know like neutral you know rational definition but we do actually use those kinds of definitions operational definitions are interesting too like um like for an example, you know, I've, I've always had an interest in electronics. I know a little bit about it. Like if you want to measure the resistance of a resistor, you know, using a meter, you could say, well, how do you, how do you define the resistance of a resistor in an electrical circuit? You could say, well, what it means to have a certain resistance and certain number of ohms of resistance is to move the resistance meters to a certain degree, this kind of operational manipulative definition. So if I, if I, you know, hook up my test in instruments in a certain way, what it means to have a certain quality is to have a certain effect on the test instruments. That is a definition. What does it mean to have a resistance of one ohm? Well, when you run one, when you have one volt of, of uh, electrical motive force, running one, one amp of current through a circuit, that's one ohm of resistance. And how do you verify that? Well, it moves the meter a certain way. That's an operational definition. It's, it's um, definition based on its function in a particular context. So definitions themselves are really, really complicated. There's lots of different kinds of them for different purposes. So it's not like you could even say, well, what's the definition of the words? And that will tell you whether a statement's true or false. You have to ask yourself, what kind of definition is, it, is in place here? What's its context? What purpose is that definition serving? And then evaluate the truth in terms of one of these models, either truth as reference or truth as, as coherence. Or a, the operational uh, definitions, for example, would be an example of pragmatic theory. What does it mean for something to be true? Well, if it has certain practical, practical, testable consequences in this context, then that would be a, a, you know, a true operational definition of a term, something we can empirically test. So definitions themselves are complicated. The last thing I wanted to cover really quickly, and again, there's, there, there won't be any tests on this. So you don't even have to inc include this in your paper, but it's, it's interesting. One thing logicians try to do is to give semantics of, uh, of, of linguistic statements that we kind of take for granted. So for example, if you have a statement like all cats are mammals, one of these simple categorical statements, all something or something, what logicians will try to do is give a more precise semantics, a more precise account of the meaning of that statement in terms of logical categories. So a logician, the kind of thing I will teach next semester if you take my logic class, would interpret that statement as something like this. And I'm just gonna read this. Don't worry about the symbols or anything. This symbol here, this upside down A means for all. So for all X, for any object, for any entity, if X is a cat, that's what's going on here, then X is a mammal. That is a, a more structured, maybe more accurate way of capturing the meaning of all cats or mammals. You can say, take any object you want for all X, if it's a cat, then it's a mammal. And then of course, the reason that logicians do this is because it gives you some, some mechanical means of deducing further things that have to follow from various sets of statements. And all of that we'll talk about in my logic class next semester. But this is the kind of, this is what, a, you know, when a logician hears something like all cats are mammals, what makes that true? Well, if it's true that for any given object, if it's a cat, then it's a mammal, then it's true that all cats are mammals. So this is a way of kind of drawing out the consequences of a statement, a seemingly ordinary statement, to what it's really saying about objects in the world. And then you can evaluate it. Is it actually true that for any given object, if it's a cat, then, a, then it's a mammal? If the answer is yes, then that's a true statement. And it's true that all cats are mammals. So here's another example, different, different categorical statement. Some cats are Siamese cats. What does that mean to a logician? A logician hears, well, there exists some object, some entity, some X, as I've written it here, such that X is both a cat and a Siamese cat. There, in other words, a, a statement like some cats are Siamese cats means there has to be at least one object 
it's maybe more, but at least one, where it's both a cat and a Siamese cat, where it falls into one category and the other category. Uh, th in other words, this, this statement here, uh, I'll kind of read it to you in logic speak. There exists some object X such that X is both a cat and, that's what this dot means, and X is a Siamese cat. This makes an existence claim. This says there has to have to actually exist something that meets both of these criteria. It's a cat and, and it's a Siamese cat. And what's interesting is a statement like this, all cats are mammals. That can be true even if there's no such thing as a cat. It can be true that even if there were a cat, it would be a mammal, even if there are no cats. So this statement here doesn't actually commit to the existence of an, oop, excuse me, undo that. This statement here doesn't commit to the existence of anything. It can be true even if there are no cats and are no mammals. Whereas this statement here can only be true if there actually is some object that is both a cat and a Siamese cat. This actually commits you to the existence of something, whereas the first statement doesn't. That's interesting. You may not realize that, that the first statement can be true even if something doesn't exist, and the second statement can't be true if that, if that object doesn't exist. That's the kind of thing that logic can do to draw out the truth consequences of some relatively ordinary statements uh, and maybe yield some predictable, testable consequences uh, for the purpose of doing science um, that, that may not have been obvious uh, for, at, at first glance. So logic can be really useful for analyzing the, 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 what I would call the truth structure of a, of, of a statement or of a theory, analyzing what the terms and the statements really mean and maybe yielding some testable consequences as, as, as a result. So that's the kind of thing that logic does to try to um, clarify the truth of some of these statements and what those statements really mean, clarify the meaning of them so you can evaluate their truth or, or falsity. But that's the kind of thing we talk about in a logic class. No need to remember it, especially don't try to remember these symbols if you're not taking a logic class. But I think you get the gist of it that you know, uh, these even seemingly ordinary statements in ordinary language have consequences logically that you may not think about at first glance until the, stru the logical structure of those statements is spelled out a bit more explicitly. And logic is really useful for that. Um, that's about all I've got for you guys. Um, I hope all of you guys turned in your paper number three. If you haven't, try to get that to me by the end of the day, uh, unless you've talked to me already previously. Remember that paper number four is due in four weeks um, at the end of, end of the semester. If, again, if you're choosing option two for completing the class, if, uh, probably none of you guys are because you're all here, but if you want to choose option two, let me know and let me know you're going to be writing an additional paper beyond paper number four. And if you want to take the extra credit option, if you want to try to improve your score in the class a bit by writing an extra credit paper, talk to me as well so I can give you some guidance on that. All, but most importantly, remember that everything for the class needs to be turned in by the last day of class so I can get all the grading done and submit the grades. Um, I'll try to get your, the, grade, the grades done on your paper number three by, say, this time next week, a week from now. Um, and don't wait to get started on paper number four, especially if you're choosing option two so you'll leave time to write, a, write an addition, additional paper. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns, as always. Other than that, I'll see you guys in five days next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. you guys have a great day. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.